A woman named Stacey Abrams gave the Democratic rebuttal to the State of the Union address last night. Abrams is not an office holder. She's a former state legislator from Georgia. She lost the governor's race there in the last election. Nevertheless, party leaders clearly have big plans for Abrams. Her speech last night wasn't much. She talked mostly about herself. But far more interesting is a piece that Abrams wrote in this month's Foreign Affairs magazine. The piece is called Identity Politics Strengthens Democracy. And if you want to understand what the Democratic Party seeks for this country, you ought to read the piece. Abrams went to Yale Law School, so the article itself is a chore to get through. It's written in that cloying, indirect, academic style that passes for erudition among our credentialed elites. Lots of meaningless adjectives, very few declarative sentences. But you'll get the point anyway. It's crystal clear. Quote, by embracing identity, Abrams writes in the final sentence, Americans will become more likely to grow as one. So ponder that for a second. The less we have in common, the more united we will be. Is that true? Well, of course not. It's absurd. Even Stacey Abrams doesn't really believe it. Nobody does. Abrams doesn't even bother to defend that premise, much less explain how exactly identity politics will unite this country. Unity is definitely not what Stacey Abrams is interested in, just the opposite. What she's selling is bitter division. Abrams spends the bulk of the piece calling on what she describes as the marginalized to unite against the, quote, dominant groups. So who is marginalized and who is dominant? That's not a small question. In the scheme of identity politics, it's the only question that matters. Everything rides on who's the victim and who's the oppressor. That's the entire equation. And Abrams spells out the answer in very clear language. The marginalized, she writes, include, quote, women, Native Americans, African Americans, immigrants, and the LGBTQ community. The dominant are everyone who's left. So do the subtraction. That's only one group. You know exactly who they are, and so does Stacey Abrams. She says these people, these unnamed people, are responsible for the suffering of everyone else, and we need to overthrow them. She uses the language of violence and war to describe what must come next. Quote, politics is the most affected method of revolt. Revolt. People get hurt in revolts. That's the nature of revolts. Stacey Abrams knows that. She wants one anyway. She doesn't hide it. Demagoguery like this would make a certain kind of sense if your only interest was in winning elections and you didn't care about what happened afterward. That's where Democrats are right now. The Democratic Party is a highly unstable collection of interest groups, many of them with radically different interests and goals. It's not a natural coalition. There's no reason all of these groups should be voting for the same candidates in every election. The only way to keep a fractious group like this together is by inventing a common enemy that everyone can oppose. You're one of us if you hate these people. Now, this often works in the short term. It worked for Democrats in the Jim Crow South for about 100 years, and that's why they still do it. The problem is that these people, these dominant groups, as Stacey Abrams says, aren't some foreign invader from a faraway land. They're your countrymen. You're not supposed to hate them or hurt them, or revolt against them. They is us. We're in this together. We're all Americans. That's the most important thing, really the only important thing. Stacey Abrams doesn't see it that way. Neither do the leaders of her party. They think they can win the next election by telling Americans they must hate their neighbors for the color of their skin. It's possible this will work one more time. But then what happens after the election? Abrams doesn't answer that question in her piece. She doesn't care. But the rest of us should think about it. No election is worth the hatred and the division of identity politics. Not if you plan to live here anyway. Elections in this country used to be based on issues, or that was the common agreement anyway. But what would happen to a country in which power is allocated on the basis of qualities you couldn't control, things you were born with, your skin color, your gender, your genetics? That would be called identity politics. The Heritage Foundation's David Azarad has been studying this question, and he joins us tonight with the answer. David, thank you very much for coming on. So what happens to a country that is run with identity politics? Uh, in the short term, it kind of works because the major, the majority group doesn't play along with it and kind of keeps quiet and does the public self-flagellation to atone for the sins of the father. But in the long run, it's untenable. How much longer until whites say, why don't we get to have an identity? And the day that happens, 
Then you get some form of Yugoslavia, Rwanda, you get balkanization and you get ethnic tribalism, groups fighting against one another. So it's tenable in the short term. I just don't see how you can still have a country in the long run with identity politics. And the great paradox is it may well create, namely white nationalism, what they claim to oppose today. Well, I don't think there's any question. And I, and I think that's really something to fear, just to be really clear, because of, of the results. So have you ever seen it? So Stacey Abrams, but it's not, I don't mean to pick on Stacey Abrams. It's, it's, she represents a much larger group of mm -hmm. people who tell us the same thing, which is this works. We must embrace it. The question is, does it work? Has it, have you, uh, you studied this question extensively. You're a scholar. Is there a country in which this way of looking at the world has produced a stable nation? I mean, you hit on it in your previous remarks. Diversity is not a strength in politics. I mean, a strength in politics is unity. I mean, if you want to have a strong, united country, you want the citizens to be united. Now, we'll have a free country. You don't want everyone to be the same. You need to make an allowance for pluralism. But it is not good to promote division. I'm fine with having hyphenated Americans. What bothers me is if you emphasize the part that comes before the American part. I think you can recognize hyphenated Americans, but you emphasize the commonalities, the shared history, the shared devotion to Republican principles, the love of country. And if there is one thing that identity politics is very strong on, is making you hate your country, making you despise your past, making you hate your fellow countrymen. Last question, if you and I hate each other over qualities we were born with and can't change, how is our division ever reconciled? How do we fix the problem between us? I don't think it can be. That's why I preferred the left we used to have in America, and Bernie Sanders is kind of the last gasp of it, that looked at class divisions. And you still get pretty contentious politics yes. with class divisions. But there's upward and downward mobility. You can't immediately tell which class you belong to. It keeps, you can still have a country with progressive class-based politics you cannot have a country with identity politics, and I should add, open borders. David Azrad, very smart analysis. Thank you for that. Thank you, Tucker.